and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd, and we'll be answering those gardening questions for the next hour. If you've got problems around your home landscape and garden, give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. Those phone volunteers will be glad to help you. If you'd rather send us an email or a few pictures to go along with your question, you can send those to byf at unl.edu. Make sure that you tell us as much as you can about that question, including where you live, and we answer those on future shows. Don't forget to check out those past shows and features on our YouTube channel. While you're there, hit subscribe so you can watch any new material we post. We also have a lot going on on our Facebook fan page, so check us out there after the show. All right, Kate, they had to show up again, They're didn't here. they? They're here, yes. They're back. Mm -hmm, exactly. So. Adult Japanese beetles are officially here. And if you're lucky enough to not be familiar with what a Japanese beetle is, they're an invasive pest that can feed on over 300 different types of plants. And so they're a really big deal in the garden and landscape. They'll feed on the leaves, the flowers, the fruits, and they'll cause damage. And there's several different ways you can manage them, but today I wanna to talk about the Japanese beetle trap. So. Um, these are widely available in stores and all Japanese beetle traps come with this little lure here. And so it's made of like a floral scent and a sex pheromone. And um, we actually don't usually recommend these in the garden and landscape because they almost work too well. A lot of the times the traps will um, get overwhelmed and they attract beetles from a very far distance. And research has shown that um, they only actually capture 75% of the beetles that they attract. So if you put this in your garden, you have this big neon sign that says buffet, plants to eat here. <laughs> so um, there's certain cases where this might be, like if you have an acreage and you put it really far away from the plants you wanna keep. But um, research has also shown that gardens that have these traps in them actually have more Japanese beetle damage than if you used a different <coughs> conventional method. So um, stay away from the traps. They work really well, but they work too well. All right, thanks, Kate. I Rock, that. <laughs> yeah, what do we have today? I actually have two weeds. One of them I'm gonna pick up ten tenderly, I guess, because, um, and we'll start with that one. This one is bull thistle, um, <coughs> and it's a native, um, and, and you know, just like the thistle family, but this one has spines on everything except the roots. Uh, they even get spines up around the coral or on the flower. So they're very difficult to handle. And this one's a little wilted and un unhappy. Um, and I'll tell you why I'm showing you this one and this one. Um, this is black nightshade. Um, you can see the characteristic little umbral flower there and um, everything else. It's a Solanaceae. Um, it's not toxic like people think. There are others that are very toxic, but this one isn't. And actually, um, Native Americans ate the berries. But the reason I show these is that in a planting bed in my yard that I hadn't touched in quite a while, I needed to s s divide some plants up. So I very carefully divided the plants up per instructions from um, people like Elizabeth and Kim and got it all ready and then immediately put a mulch thing on it. But I disturbed the soil. And then that was, you know, that was last fall. And then this spring I have about, <clears throat> you know, eight of these nasty critters and about 10 of these. It's in an ornamental bed, so there's not anything I can really do about it except, you know, you can you can pr pull these up. They're an annual. It's relatively easy to get them out of the ground. And the bull thistle, you've got to dig the taproot out anyway. So I'm going to have to disturb it again. But the idea that that planting bed had been in and fully mature for over 20 years, and yet now it's got all these weeds in it. So when you're mm -hmm. moving soil, moving plant material, just realize you're going to bring up mm -hmm. weed seeds that's down there, and they can stay dormant in the soil from 10 to 40 years. So just be careful with that and be on the lookout because this is on an out of, plate, yard, out of sight place in my yard. And I walked around the corner and went in the other back gate and I'm like, holy crap, <laughs> I mean, where did all these come from? And I thought I'm supposed to know better and I didn't. All right, thanks Rock. I hope that's not one of your tomato plants. Well, actually Lauren. it is and just like Rock. I went to my garden and I said, holy something. And uh, you know, I had uh, a couple tomato plants after not really paying attention for a couple weeks and kind of having a weed mess and recovering things. Uh, two tomato plants side by side that looked like this that were in normal planting distance apart. And all my other tomato plants looked great. And so uh, just showing this as an example, you know, we talk about herbicide injury and such, uh, but those would be all the plants, and this was just two of the plants. 
They were in close proximity to one another, so there's a virus that we see in tomatoes uh, that's brown rigose fruit virus that isn't real common, uh, but I'm, I believe that's what this is. Hmm. And uh, it's transmitted mechanically, so just the contact from plant to plant would do that. Maybe it was infected when I planted it. Uh, just you, you commonly see virus infected plants in transplants. It can be seed transmitted. Uh, but this is one that would continue to spread. So it's definitely a time to rogue it out. And that's what I did here and brought it along to share tonight. And you're not gonna put it in the compost pile? No, this one's gonna go in the, actually, you know, it's just gonna go in the yard waste can, but So the pathologist should not... brought in a disease infested plant and the herbicide guy brought in weeds. weeds. We love our, From our, our passion, yards. our job and our passion they is our hobby car. An invasive rock. insect. It's 100%. Elizabeth, yeah. let's, let's bail the panel out. I'll do one better. No, uh, so what I brought in is I brought in a lot of different herbs. And so when we talk about herbs, the herbs that we grow for foliage, um, we need to make sure that they don't flower. And the herbs that we commonly grow for the foliage, we're talking the basil, um, we're talking the oregano, um, the sage. These we really want to make sure that we avoid flowering on there. And the reason for that is when they flower, that changes the essential oils within that plant and it affects the taste. And so if we want that good tasting basil, we need to make sure that we look at the ends to make sure that we're not getting those blooms. So if we're starting to see those blooms on the sage or the oregano or the basil, it's time Time to go ahead and cut those off. Um, the ones that we grow for flower or for seed, we want to make sure that we let them flower. So we're talking our dill. Um, and one of the ones that works both ways is cilantro and coriander. Now I know Kim's favorite herb is cilantro. Um, not. But um, what cilantro is, is um, you know, we eat it for the foliage and then when it starts to um, go to seed, that's when it turns into coriander. So that's one of the ones that can go both ways. So if you want to use it as cilantro, then make sure that it doesn't flower or set seed. If we want to use it for coriander, then we need to let it go that way. But now's the time that some of our herbs are starting to set flower. So if you want to keep them um, looking their best, we need to go in and just pinch or remove those flowers out of there. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, Kate, you have uh, a lot of insect questions. Imagine that. Your first uh, two pictures come to us from Western Oto County. He called this an alien. What is this? So these are actually really cool flies. They're called robber flies and they're predatory. And depending on your point of view, you might find them fantastic. You might not like them. Um, beekeepers might not like them because they're robber flies and sometimes they hang around in front of beehives robbing the bees. But they also eat things like grasshoppers and there's actually research in the um, sand hills of Nebraska where a certain species of robber fly contributed, like they ate 2% of the grasshopper population there. So they can be really good in a garden, maybe not so much if you're a beekeeper. Love it. All right, your next one comes to us from Sioux City, Iowa. He wants to know what type of insect this is. <laughs> this is also a robber fly. And mm -hmm. as you can see, I think it's holding a wasp there. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of generalist predators. They'll eat <clears throat> pretty much any insect that they can find. All right. You have a cannot identify this bee or wasp, and this is from Northwestern Douglas County. So this is a really cool one, I think. Um, it's one of our solitary bees, and it's actually, I believe this one's the giant resin bee. So it's not a native species. It was introduced to the States in like the 90s or something, but these ones will nest in um, cavities in wood. So a lot of times that will be in trees, but sometimes it will be carpenter bee cavities. They'll actually kill the carpenter bees so they can take over the nest. But once again, they're solitary, which means they're not aggressive. So it's just kind of a lovely bee to see because they can pollinate as well. All right, and then your final one here is from Omaha. And he found these outside on the deck and around the outside. Are they good guys, bad guys? And if they're bad guys, how does he get rid of them? Yeah, so I've been seeing a lot of these <clears throat> lately too. So this one in particular is a European earwig. Um, and earwigs are kind of one of those like neutral insects. They're omnivores, so sometimes they'll feed on things. Um, and in rare cases, they can be a pest in the garden because they'll feed on flowers and fruits. Um, if you're not seeing that damage in the garden, nothing really to do. Um, and they don't like dig into your ears. Like <laughs> people think earwigs do that. They're called earwigs because they're hind wings. Someone thought it looked like an ear. So. All right, thanks Kate. Rock, you have uh, three pictures on this first one. This comes to us from Atkinson. 
what is this weedy grass that is taking over her yard and the roots are short, they form a mat, what can she do about this? Now this is tumble windmill grass and the seed head is really characteristic because the wind catches it when it's mature and it rolls across your yard and your lawn planting seeds as it goes about because they just shatter and fall. Um, but the good news is that we didn't have a really good selective control measure for the longest time, but in the lawn you can use mesotrione um, or tenacity um, and it's readily available on the internet as well as in many products that are available at garden stores. And, but you're gonna have to be persistent because it is a perennial and it does have a, even though it's a shallow root system, it's relatively extensive. So you're gonna have to take multiple applications. Uh, don't spray in the summer, but start spraying this fall and probably a couple in the spring and they should be able to eradicate it. All right, thanks Rock. And then you have two pictures on this next one. This is a carny viewer. She thought this was river oats or sea oats. Uh, she's seen it under the goldfinch feeder. Um, so this is not um, sea oats. I don't, I'm not sure, maybe there's a river oats, but I'm just not sure, I think sea oats is what they're looking at. And it doesn't have enough loop in the seed head for me to think it's sea oats. But the dead giveaway, thanks to the viewer for letting us know it was under the finch feeder, because this is canary grass, which is a common component of seed mixes. And of course, <clears> when that <throat> bird is working it, it falls down to the ground and it germinates. Um, that's where a lot of people get their sunflowers and stuff from and, and it'll germinate and, and uh, you know if they want to control it I just pull it up or mow it off. It doesn't need any herbicides at this point in time but, but that's canary grass. All right, thank you Rock. All right, uh, Lauren, two pictures on this first one. This is a lilac, two leaves here. He says every year about this time, late June, uh, the leaves turn brown and fall off. Well, and, and we're just, we're gonna go one direction on this, and it, again, it, it could be something else, but um, there's a bacterial leaf disease that we see on lilac. Uh, the additional symptom that they might see would be if some of the individual shoots, you know, possibly even earlier in the year would die, or if they see any black stems on the green and growing tissue. Uh, but it looks a lot like the bacterial leaf spot we see. Uh, pruning out any diseased uh, twigs or branches, possibly earlier, which they may be missing uh, in that. Uh, would be probably the best thing to do. And then the other uh, option would be to make sure they're not overhead irrigating. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one and then another viewer with the same plant, slightly different issue. This is uh, blueberry bushes in Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> you might engage Elizabeth a little bit here on this one too because yeah. um, blueberries in general, really difficult to grow uh, mm -hmm. in our soils here. Uh, require a very low pH and, and both of these plants, and I think we have another one a little bit right, later. Two Kim, more here, right on this very next similar. one. Actually, are they the next pictures? Let's go yeah, ahead and show those two. too. Yeah. Uh, so this one where we're seeing some fruit shrivel and dropping, uh, here's some dried up fruits. Uh, I really believe that all of these could possibly be related to nutrition uh, and just poor growing conditions. Uh, didn't really see anything on, on any of the pictures that would indicate a disease. And I don't know, Elizabeth, if you'd want to comment on just overall growth for blueberries and our Nebraska soils. Yeah, because that's the difficult part is their, their pH. They like it around that four or five. You go to you know central Nebraska, we've got seven and a half, closer to eight. It's just not happy. And yes, you could plant them in a container and you could amend that soil in that container. But even then, it's going to be difficult to keep them to that right pH where they're going to be happy. And, and also difficult to keep the soil that low, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you do uh, amendments to try to make it more city. Right, all right, thanks guys. Elizabeth, uh, you have three pictures on this first one. This viewer has a strawberry plot that produced almost next to nothing. It's overgrown, it's been productive. Does he restore, does he start over? Cut it, mow it, thin it. So if we're talking strawberries, most of the time we're looking at rejuvenation every three to four years. If it's been longer than three or four years, your best bet is to start over. Um, because what we would need to do is we would need to go in and rototill and make those rows 12 inches. And then we need to remove the mother plants. And then we need to thin between the plants every four <laughs> to six to eight inches in between there. And we need to mow them off one inch above the crown of the plant. So if it's been a long time since you've rejuvenated, I just start over and get some new plant material and then you can work on that process every three to four years. All right, thanks Elizabeth. You have uh, two pictures on this next one. Uh, this this is a herbicide damaged grapevine and the herbicide was sprayed on a hot day. He wants to know whether he can expect the vines to recover and the grape crop itself. 
You know, just go ahead and, and leave those vines alone. Um, it depends on what product it is. Some of them could still be green. They just might be disformed. And so it's still gonna rejuvenate the crown of that plant. When it comes to herbicide drift, there's no pre-harvest interval from when it's drifted to when it's safe to eat. So we really can't recommend that they eat any grapes off of that vine um, as being the most cautious that they could possibly be. And so, you know, I wouldn't recommend that they eat any grapes that come off of there and just let that vine recharge. The good news is, is next spring when you give it a good haircut, you're going to cut those ends off and then they won't be there. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. And one picture here. Uh, this is a viewer who didn't remember planting this. What is it? More than likely, it's that ironweed. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to have a purple um, flower at the top. It's going to be kind of flat. It's one of our uh, weeds of Nebraska that we have commonly. And so um, I'd, I'd leave it in, but that's just me. It's great for pollinators. It is. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, chlorosis is a condition that can affect a number of plants in your landscape. Trees, turf, and shrubs can all go off color at times for a variety of reasons. Jeff Culbertson starts us off this evening by helping us solve the problem of chlorosis. Every season on Backyard Farmer, we'll get several questions about why is my tree not the right color? Uh, in this particular magnolia here, we see this lighter green, yellow uh, coloration with these newer leaves in particular. And that's an indication of chlorosis. Chlorosis is a symptom of a variety of things. It's kind of a big term. A lot of things can go into it. Uh, there can be a lot of different causes. It could be too high a pH in the soil. Um, it can be too much moisture, too dry, uh, soil compaction. Um, so there's just a lot of things that can happen. Maybe there's been some root damage at some point here. So there's a lot of things that may cause chlorosis in plants. Uh, what we're gonna try to do is figure out what we can do to try to help this plant get through this and improve its condition. Because long-term chlorosis will weaken the plant um, and at some point it'll eventually fail and you'll have to replace this tree. So a couple of things that we're gonna wanna think about here, um, some easy solutions to see if, that, if it will help, is to come in, expand our uh, mulch area around this plant, remove any other turf near the plant, uh, so we may be out to the edge of the drip line here, and that will help reduce some of that compaction on the root zone. We may even come in with a couple inches of some good compost, so integrate the compost into the soil around the base of the plant, add a couple inches of mulch, make sure that we water it appropriately. We don't want this plant to dry out. At the same time, we don't want to oversaturate the soil. So there's, there's kind of that fine line there. So we'll try some of those things to see if that will help. You could look at, you know, a, a quick fix is a uh, iron-based mineral foliar spray. Many times that will help. Um, and then if you have a larger tree, so if this was a larger shade tree, Pit oaks in particular um, respond well to the many different injections that you can use on pin oaks. Uh, that species in particular responds very well to that sort of thing. And again, it's not a long-term uh, cure. It's something that has to be done every few years depending on the process that you use. So you'll have to know that once you've started that, if you want that tree to continue to do well, you're going to have to continue that process. But chlorosis affects a lot of things. It'll affect you know, perennials, uh, it'll affect your turf. Those are more easily uh, amended with some sort of iron-based mineral that you can put down, and that'll help those uh, plants get through that more quickly. But for our woody plants, um, you're gonna look at something a little bit longer lasting, again, trying to amend the soils, mulching, thinking about how we're watering the plant to see if we can bring this out of that, out of the chlorosis kind of spiral that it's going through. If you've got some lime green trees and shrubs that aren't supposed to be that way, chances are there's some chlorosis going on. And hopefully these tips will help you get them back to green and growing and those plants that actually are genetically supposed to be lime green. They always look chlorotic to me in Nebraska. <laughs> All right, Kate, uh, two on this one. And oh, I wonder what this is. I found this on a common milkweed on June 25th in Johnson County. What is this? 
So those are stink bug nymphs. These ones, I believe, are the brown marmorated stink bug, which is another one of those invasive pests. Mm -hmm. Particularly in like crop production with vegetables, they can cause cat facing on fruits. Um, usually in the garden, they're not a big deal, but the big thing with these is that they're one of the fall invaders. So when the temperatures drop in the fall, they look for a place to overwinter and they like to get into our home. So just make sure that your house is bug proof for the winter. All right. Uh, your next one here is from Elm Creek. What are these? Found them on a leaf. Yeah. So these are also stink bug nymphs, but I believe these ones are from a native species, the green stink bug. So they're large and they're this beautiful green color. Um, those ones prefer to feed on like seeds, oats, nuts, and they'll also do a little bit of cat facing on fruits, but once again, not a huge deal to control. All right, and one final picture, and this is from a Lincoln viewer, found this caterpillar. What is it, friend or foe? I love IDing caterpillars, it's my <laughs> favorite. So this one is a um, saddled prominent moth caterpillar. It's kind of a mouthful, but you can see about that uh, black, brown U shape on its back, that's the saddle. Um, so these ones will feed on woody plants, um, birch, oak, um, blueberry, things like that. Um, you found it on a retaining wall. It's not a foe to the retaining wall, so just leave it be. It looks like it's going to form a cocoon soon. And unfortunately, the moths don't look as pretty as the caterpillars. They're just kind of a drab brown moth. All right, thanks, Kate. Rock, two pictures on this first one. Uh, what is this plant? <coughs> We've had this earlier, but she does describe its flowers as small and white. Yes, yeah, so I originally thought this was common nettle, but then you look at the flowers and it's not right. And I, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to have to take a closer look at this one because I... It's geom. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad Kim was here. Because <laughs> it looks like common nettle until uh -huh. you look at the flower, right? And uh -huh. then I saw the flower and it threw me for a loop. So I apologize, but Kim stepped in. Thank you. Yeah, and control or just let <clears throat> it be? I would just let it be. I don't think I would put anything on that. Yeah, just fine. All right, uh, two pictures on this one too, and this is growing all over. They don't know whether this is a weed or a ground cover. I love this plant. This is commonly, it's a day, day flower. And you know, people say, well, it only flowers once, but you know, usually there's several that grow over several days. So it's really showy for a short amount of time. Um, it's really got floppy leaves, so it needs other plants to kind of hold it up. But I find it just to be kind of an intriguing plant the way it coexist and does really well. I mean, if it gets away from you, you can cut it back and it's still gonna flower. But what I love is that while I was looking into the, looking a little bit closer to this one, when it's when you take the Spanish name for it and translate it, it means the herb of the cooked chicken. I don't know why that is, but I find that really intriguing. <laughs> oh my goodness. The herb of the cooked chicken. That's a pretty common weed in a lot of flower beds, and I, I have is. a lot of it in some of mine I was gonna pull out, but I think I'm just gonna leave it now. Oh no, I think- Because Rock really enjoys it, and when my wife asked me about it, I'm just gonna say, well, Rock really likes it. Because you can't control really it. It, it won't I don't know die. what you're gonna put on it, right? <laughs> it I just won't pull, die. Pull. I don't think, yeah, I don't think you wanna, it, I wouldn't mess with know. it. All right, you have one more here. Uh, uh, Rock, this is, um, along with everything else, this is the one picture that we thought we could maybe identify, lots of weedy sorts of things. She says this doesn't flower, but does that mean that she's just cutting it back? What did we decide this was? I, I'm pretty confident it's an aster, mm -hmm. but there's 170 different asters, so um, I think it does flower. I mean, most right. of the asters she'd do. Let it. And, right. and so I, I, we're gonna need to see a picture of the flower or something closer to the leaves because yeah, I'm confident it's an aster, but other than that, so I, I got one out of four or one out of three on that one. My <laughs> you bad. did just fine. <laughs> All right, Lauren, uh, your first one is, uh, she has issues with both tomatoes and potatoes. We're focusing on the taters mm -hmm. on this one. Uh, kind of a constant issue here. Uh, a few different things here. If they've been growing tomatoes in this site for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, it could be that they've accumulated some type of a, a soil-borne fungal disease. The way they're yellowing around the edge and the bottom and coming up, it, it looks like some sort of a root rot. Mm -hmm. um, I would just try to ensure you're not overwatering. Um, I'm not sure if they're in shade or what their site is. Uh, just, just make sure it's in a good growing condition otherwise and that there's good drainage in the site. Uh, nothing to treat for though. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. Why are the tomatoes <clears throat> so sad? She's, she says this is celebrity. Okay. And, and this one also, I, in, in particular pictures, I just see some lower leaves yellowing, 
which will happen naturally and, and I can't really see a specific leaf spot or something. We have a lot of different foliar diseases of tomato that you can have. Uh, but in this case, it looks like they're doing a lot of things right. I see some straw mulch in the background. Uh, they've got them up. I would just simply try to remove some of those leaves as they're starting like that. Make sure if, if they do have drip irrigation, like it looks like they may, uh, that would be ideal as far as disease management and making sure you're not overhead irrigating. Uh, and then just kind of let that go. I'm, I'm not going to recommend the fungicide for that. All right, and one more, and this is Elkhorn <coughs> uh, zucchinis. She had a couple that were good to eat, but then all of a sudden she's got this going on. She does check every day, Kate, for squash beetles and eggs, and she hasn't seen any creatures yet. So a couple things, and I was trying to tell, it looked to me like both of them were on the terminal end of the fruit. And uh, I've experienced this too, and, and we talk about blossom end rot, but I haven't really seen that much on zucchini, but I think there's some nutritional thing, and it may be just some natural fruit thinning, um, but I, I never could really figure out exactly what this was. Any advice from anyone else on the panel? No, you're right. Okay. I think it's I think it's a nutritional, it's not a disease. Yeah. Uh, make sure you don't have soil contact on the fruit if you got some mulch to put under, but otherwise I would okay. hope for, hope for some eat. more. Usually you get more zucchini than you need. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, you have three pictures uh, for this first one. This is a Japanese tree lilac in Omaha. Um, peeling bark, dead limbs, all sorts of stuff. Uh, he did send, I think, three pics here, and that's probably the telltale right there. You know, at this point in time, remove anything dead, damaged, or diseased. That can be removed at any point in time. Um, and just continue to watch the tree. Watch for it for signs of flagging, dropping leaves earlier than normal, things like that. Um, but yeah, that, that base picture really wasn't a, a good sign of that. All right. Uh, one picture here from Sutton. They cut down a monster cottonwood tree, and they want to know how to keep those suckers from continuing to try to take over. So in order to keep those suckers from coming up, you're going to need to treat the root system. So that you could use something that contains triclopyr or a triclopyr 2,4-D combination that's safe to use on turf. Um, until that root system dies, you're going to have suckers popping up in the yard. All right. And two pictures on this next one. This is from Kennard or Kennard. So flowers with pink, then it has what she's calling green balls on it. What is this? That is one of the really fun peaches. It's a purple leaf peach. I believe it's bonfire is the name. Um, the main thing is you're going to need to thin those peaches to about eight inches apart. So that way you get some good quality fruit out of it. And then do some research on how to properly prune a, a peach tree. Um, we are pruning them a little different than we would a shade tree. So it takes a little bit of different finesse to it. But that's going to be a really fun peach tree near the house. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Are purple leaf peaches as productive as green leaf peaches? No. Not really. Oh, okay. I no. Think they well, would be, but I didn't know. And peaches in general in Nebraska take about two, three years before they produce, and then commercially they live for about eight. So enjoy it while you have it. <laughs> All right. Well, for our weekly update at our garden, Terry is going to highlight some of our All America selections. So here's Terry to show us another fantastic ornamental in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're continuing looking at all of those new 2022 All-America Selection winners. If any of you have ever been to the garden and listened to me talk about any of my annual combinations, you're going to remember that I have always talked about Verbena banariensis and how wonderful a plant I like it. Well, they actually came out with a new one and I think this one may top the original. This is Verbena banariensis vanity. It is a little bit smaller head than the original, a lot darker, and I'm starting to like it. It's gonna become one of my favorites. This one is an annual. It will get to be approximately 30 inches tall. It's gonna have that dark green stem. It's gonna be kind of that nice background in some of your containers or landscapes so that you can still see through it, but still give that definition of kind of a, a wall or border. The judges say this is a fantastic one. It will attract butterflies all day long and it will make a statement in your container. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out Verbena Banariensis Vanity. And right now it is time for lightning. Elizabeth, you're in the hot seat. Let's do it. Your first question is how can you tell when to harvest your onions? When the tops kind of flop over and it looks like they made a bulb. 
All right, uh, this is a viewer who has Van Hoot or the bridal wreath spirea, the white one, wants to know when to prune it. Usually those we prune after flowering. All right, we have a Sheldon, Iowa viewer who wants to know when to prune red twig dogwood, willow, and amber maple. <laughs> Uh, before they leaf out, yeah, cut back the um, willow and the dogwood for sure. All right. Um, we have a viewer who wants to, has seven suns shrub and wants a single stem tree. Is that possible? I wouldn't recommend it. It's more fun with multi stems. All right. Uh, this is a Council Bluffs, Iowa viewer who dug and divided their iris last fall and they're not flowering now. Is that common? Um, usually we divide iris about now in July, and so that's the possibility is it might have been too late and it might have needed uh, some extra time. All right. Uh, if you use blossom set for tomatoes and you do it more often than the recommended two weeks, is that a problem? Yeah, don't apply it. <laughs> it doesn't work. All right. That's perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> All right, Lauren. You ready for your long answers that you promised? Ready as some seasoned ribs to throw on the grill on the 4th of July tonight, Kim. <laughs> All right, <laughs> this, this viewer has raspberries and all of a sudden the ends of the canes are dying. Any ideas on that one? Uh, could be Phytophthora. All right, we have a viewer that has patches of a fescue lawn about six to 12 inches around going sort of tan. Uh, with the warm weather, it'd be a good chance that's brown patch. All right, uh, a Columbus viewer has little black flecks on their tomatoes little flex on the fruit. Could be bacterial speck. All right, we have a viewer who wants to know what your method is of keeping the peaches from rotting oh, on the counter. I, I like a warm water bath, and uh, it, I, I can't recall the exact temperature, but if you heat the water to, I believe it's 160 degrees, and soak the peaches for two minutes, and we gotta look this up to be exact, but I think that's it. But I'm under pressure right now and I might miss the numbers there. All right, and then we have a viewer who wants to know whether they can use neem oil as a preventative for powdery mildew. I don't know about that one. No, Pass. insecticide. <laughs> no, neem has some antimicrobial properties too, so yeah, it may it be that it could, but I, I just, I haven't looked at that closely. So we're I we're all laughing at the thought of your warm water bath. <laughs> Am I, well. I thought about how I was I said like, did that. he really just say that? <laughs> Better in a cold water bath. But no, warm, warm, hot water dips help in fruit uh, as far as storage because a lot of the spores of the fungi are on the surface and the hot water bath will kill them. All right. Rock, are you ready? <clears throat> I don't know after that. But yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have a viewer who uh, wants to know whether he has to remove his old turf before he lays new sod. Yes. Okay, is there a better product than Trimec as a weed and feed so that you can use the clippings on the, on the garden? Well, you can use the clippings after about three or four mowings, so, you know, and that's gonna be true of any herbicide. All right, uh, we have a viewer, uh, we answered this question before about scouring rush. He wants uh, the repetition of the chemical name for scouring rush and control. And I'm not gonna be able to do that right now. Okay. Uh, we have a Hickman viewer who has one inch cracks in the soil despite watering. Is there, will this be harmful to the turf? It could be so dry that the water is just running off and not percolating down, um, and hence it's cracking. So uh, do more sets in shorter times. All right, uh, we have someone who has given up on Creeping Charlie and they have read that you can like put down black plastic and solarize it. Does that actually work? Not with black plastic. If you solarize, you got to use clear plastic because you want the sun to heat up the existing soil. So clear plastic will work, and that's a drastic step to take, but if they haven't been able to control it with proper application timing of herbicides, then certainly solarization would work for that. Look it up on the internet because it's a black plastic is a common misconception with solarization. It's got to be clear. All right, excellent. All right, Kate, you ready? Sure. This is the Navoca um, viewer who says she thinks thrips have been the cause of her hibiscus buds drying up. Would that be true? Um, if she saw thrips on the flower, they could they could cause some like damage to it, but usually not drying up. All right. Uh, we have a Gretna viewer who wants to know where the pollinators are. 
Um, they're there, but we need to plant more native plants to attract them. All right. A Lincoln viewer wants to know what to spray on her lawn and her patio for mosquito control. Um, I actually don't recommend spraying for the adults. The best thing you can do is treat stagnant water or dump it. All right. An Omaha viewer wants to know um, about buying ladybugs to release in the yard for good reasons. Um, if you have a problem with aphids, Ladybugs would be good, but if you get the adults, just keep in mind that they fly away so you can get the larvae instead. All right. Uh, we have a Gretna viewer who has bagworms and they're already in their little bags already. Is it too late to do anything? Um, if they're small enough, you can still treat with BT. Otherwise, as they get larger, a pyrethroid would be better. All right. Nice job, all. Okay, Elizabeth, what are our plants of the week? So we got a couple of really nice plants of the week. Um, the one with the really fun flower here is one of my favorites just because I know we can't grow it and I, when I'm on campus, I have to go see it. It's the Bottle Brush Buckeye. Um, and it has this very long um, flower stalk to it. It's a suckering large shrub um, for part shade, and it's got some really fun uh, foliage, like with other buckeyes, it has a, a compound, a palmately compound leaf to it. And so that's really fun with that one, and it kind of has like a tropical um, like appearance to it. The other one with the big flower is a smooth hydrangea. And so sometimes hydrangeas will have sterile flowers and sometimes that's what gives us that big head on it. And then other times is where they have um, the other uh, flowers. And so when you see those with the big uh, lacy caps on them, those are the sterile ones, but this one smells amazing. Um, this was an Annabelle one that reverted to the, to the straight species. And so that's where we're getting that straight, that sweet smell from um, is all these flowers on here. And the pollinators were all over mm -hmm. that one. All right, Kate, uh, first question here. This is a viewer in Malvern, Iowa. Deformed oak leaves with something on the branches that looks like tiny snails. Yeah, so this is um, Kermes oak scale. So scale insects, they feed on the plant sap and they can do damage over time. Um, so these ones in particular, they mature in the spring and they'll lay eggs late summer. Um, and it's important to note that as adults, they have this hard exoskeleton and they hide the eggs under those exoskeletons, which makes them hard to treat. They're protected against any insecticides. So timing is really important here. The eggs are going to hatch um, September, October, and so you wanna try to target those crawler stages as they crawl out from the protection of the mother scale, and you can treat it with a pyrethroid at that time. Um, otherwise, the other options would be like a dormant oil spray um, before, the, it, before the tree leaves out, and you can try to do like a systemic of imidacloprid that'll give you protection next year. All right, thank you, Kate. Your next one here is a Maxwell viewer that has an insect on the underside of the raspberry leaves. Yeah, so I believe these are um, tortoise beetle pupae. Um, so tortoise beetles are a type of leaf beetles, and they do feed on leaves. Um, but I'm not sure exactly what type it is. I will say that we do have some really beautiful tortoise beetles here in Nebraska. We have a golden tortoise beetle. They're really fun to look at. Um, but these are pupae, so they're gonna be adults soon. So just maybe keep an eye out to see when they emerge. All right, a Valentine viewer has a growth like this on an elm. He thinks it's an American elm. Yeah, so this is um, elm coxcomb galls, and they're called coxcomb galls because they're supposed to resemble the coxcomb on a rooster. I learned that today. Anyways, these are called but um, caused by um, grass root aphids. So the aphids will feed on grass roots for part of, part of their life cycle. They'll go to the elm tree, lay eggs on the bark. When those hatch, they'll move to the leaves. It's really complicated. And when they start feeding on the leaves, the plant kind of overreacts and forms these galls. So great pastime is just breaking open galls. I love doing it, you should do it. And inside each of those, you should find about a dozen aphids. The good news is, is that it's mostly a cosmetic issue, doesn't really affect the overall health of the tree, but if you find it like gets worse year after year, you can try one of those systemics. All right, and one more here, and this is a McClelland, Iowa viewer that is calling this a bubble-headed bug. Yeah, so this one is a false bombardier. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, beetle. So there's a false bombardier beetle and a real bombardier beetle. Um, and you can tell by the color of the head. The real ones are cooler because they will spray this noxious chemical that reaches like 100 degrees Celsius um, against predators. So don't touch those 
false ones, they will make like a bad smell, but um, they're quite a bit better than the real ones. All right, thanks, Kate. Uh, Rock, your first one here comes to us from Bennington. <clears throat> she has a dog pee spot. What does she do about this? Um, it's right by the door, right off the patio, so the dog is not moving very far. Uh, it's probably a female because it's off, you know, it's not, it's squatting rather than getting, most, more than likely it's female, and it's gonna habituate, it's habituated to that spot, so unless she can train it to go somewhere else, um, and she can try to reseed that, but the soil's been affected negatively, and there's a lot of products on the market uh, that are supposed to help the soil get better. Um, unless she wants to actually, and they don't work, uh, by the way, sorry, um, but if she wants to flush that with water after, every time the dog pees, that certainly is a possibility, or train the dog to go somewhere else, and there are there is some pretty good information on the internet about getting them to go somewhere else. It's just that it's so concentrated right there by the door. I'm assuming that this is probably a smaller, medium-sized or smaller dog, but that's a pretty severe um, damage, and, and you, it's not gonna recover because the, the seedlings aren't gonna survive the continued use of the, that is the restroom. All right, uh, your next one is from Omaha, and they're really asking about whether they should, how, whether they should cut back that big grassy hill every spring, um, <clears throat> remove all the brownish stuff in the spring. They didn't do it this time, and what do we recommend for ornamental grasses? Well, certainly they need of... to be cut back either in the fall or the spring. Most of the time we recommend the spring because you like them, you know, the blowing in the wind and all the pretty stuff that happens in the winter, especially when it's pretty barren. Uh, but they do need to be cut back, and that's, um, that's a pretty thick stand, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure what species it is, but all of them should be cut back. Um, and the debris removed so it doesn't smother the existing, but yep, definitely cut that back. All right, and then you have three pictures of this next one, um, more and more of these in their lawn, and um, he thinks it's birch on one seedlings, and then there's something that's clearly not woody, so how do we get rid of all these seedlings? Well, the, the tree seedlings, and I think those are, they may be ash seedlings, ash. But, um, yeah. not birch, but I, they don't tolerate mowing, so as long as they're mowing regularly. Um, these here are not um, tree seedlings, but um, you know, wait until fall, um, see if they're, I can't tell what they are because we don't have enough structure on them, but at the end of the day, um, if they really want to go the herbicide route, they, they can come back, but mowing will probably take those out and just you know, don't be overly aggressive when you're mowing, mow them when it needs it. They'll take rid of the trees and probably that one because that looks like something that's going to grow up and um, <coughs> maybe even a solen ACA, but it's going to get bigger and they just don't like mowing. Okay, excellent. All right, Lauren, you have uh, three pictures of this, and it's on bergamot, which of course is uh, one of those <coughs> monardas. I've never seen this before on bergamot. That's a rust, mm -hmm. and uh, not exactly sure what the cycle is. Uh, nothing to do at this time, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, if they really wanted to manage it, this time of year, next year, go about a month earlier, and you could use a fungicide application. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is a North Platte viewer. It's a five-year-old hosta, and um, she's not seen any spray drift of any kind, so. And, and this one uh, could be concerning. It just kind of depends what else is in the landscape. If mm -hmm. there are lots of hostas in the landscape, just to be cautious, you may want to rogue this out because it does look like it could be some virus when you when you zoom in on it. There are mm -hmm. some ringing in the spots. Um, and this particular picture shows it. And that looks very much like a virus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna say which one it is for sure, um, but those can be spread to other hostas. So if that's the only hosta you have in the landscape, you could just simply enjoy it and watch it. But if you're concerned about movement to other hostas, I would rogue that plant out. All right, thanks, Lauren. Elizabeth, you have three on this one. This is a, a coneflower bed in Grand Island. And four or five years, they were beautiful. And then this year, they're, oops, this is onions first. Um, we ended up with your onions, I think, on this one first. Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Yep, if we take a look at the It's onion. still Grand Island. Yep, still Grand <laughs> Island. Um, if you take a look at the leaves, you'll notice little white spots. Um, and so in Grand Island, we did have some hail. Mm -hmm. So I would not be surprised if we had a little bit of hail damage on there. Um, nothing that they can really do at this point in time. Just go ahead and watch it. We wouldn't apply any, any 
insecticides or fungicides for those. All right, and your next one is a Harvard, Nebraska viewer that had cabbage that got damaged by the hail and they wonder whether it's going to recover. Will that split just get worse? More than likely due to the heat, it's just gonna to continue to get worse. So your best bets go ahead and just um, harvest that one now. All right, excellent, thanks Elizabeth. Well, you know, we've been revisiting some great content from our partners in Western Nebraska. Tonight, Amanda Philippi with Nebraska Game and Parks details some differences in weather, environment, and critters out west. the Wildcat Hills State Recreation Area in western Nebraska. We're located just eight miles south of Gearing and our habitat out here is a little bit different than on the eastern part of the state. Um, our average rainfall is 10 to 12 inches so a lot of our plant life and our ecosystems are drought tolerant. Um, so we have some unique species out here for plants that maybe you don't see on the eastern side of the state, as well as some interesting wildlife that goes along with that. So we have bighorn sheep out here, elk. We also have grassland species like pronghorn and um, ponderosa pine specific species like red crossbills, um, which is a small songbird that feeds on our um, pine cone seeds out here. Out at the Wildcat Hills, we're mainly a ponderosa pine um, woodland. Um, so we have a lot of ponderosa pines. And then we're in a short grass to mixed grass um, prairie as well. So a lot of our plants are a little bit lower growing due to that, that average rainfall out here. The Wildcat Hills are very unique. Um, they don't look like a lot of the, the rest of the state. So on the eastern side of the state, we see a lot of open fields and croplands. And as you work your way west, we have a lot of rocky buttes and ponderosa pine woodlands. So it's very unique. So we're similar to the eastern part of the state. We are a little drier out here. Um, and I think our average rainfall, like I mentioned earlier, is a little lower than the eastern part of the state. So what we're also dealing with out here is drought um, and wild wildfire dangers as well. So out here in western Nebraska we are a little drier out here but we have unique species that are adapted for those drier environments with different wildlife and different plants. So some of the plants that you can grow on the eastern end of the state we maybe get to grow some slightly different ones out here. So we invite everyone to come out here to western Nebraska and see all these unique species. And as Amanda said, slightly drier and much windier out west. You can still use those native and adapted plants out there with a lot of success. And your twin says hello, <laughs> Elizabeth. All right, first picture is yours, Kate. Uh, this is just a sighting. What is that? Yep, so this again is the Japanese beetle. And so I already talked about the traps. Um, but right now with Japanese beetles, the best thing you can do is go out in the evening with a bucket of soapy water and bat those bad boys in there. Um, otherwise, there are chemical options um, for organics. You can use neem or pyola, but keep in mind that gives you only about three to seven days till you need to reapply. Um, for synthetics, there's like carbaryl, permethrin, cyfluthrin, and that gives you about two weeks. Just keep in mind that Japanese beetles like flowers and we don't wanna apply anything to flowers because we need to protect the pollinators too. Perfect, all right. And then we have an Omaha viewer <clears throat> who has uh, inch high dirt mounds at the end of the driveway, pencil side holes, inch long chimney on one, what is this? So um, I'm pretty sure these are most likely going to be sweat bees. So um, because they're bees, they're really excellent pollinators. They're not gonna be causing damage to the plant. And um, I really don't recommend spraying them, of course, but if you wanna discourage sweat bees from making mounds in the future, you can try to keep that area well irrigated. They don't like the wet soil, or you can put a nice layer of mulch there too. All right, and one final picture. This is a papillion viewer. Um, she thinks this bit her. What is this? Well, I'm so sorry you got bit, but this is actually really great to have in the garden. So this is a, um, a green lacewing larva, and they're also sometimes called aphid lions because they eat pests like aphids and other soft-bodied insects. And I believe that the horticulture greenhouse here on East Campus even mm -hmm. applied these in their greenhouses as a great form of biological control. They did, you are right. All right, uh, Rock, this is a property near Hallam and this weed is growing in the ditch. What is this? This is an intriguing, I wouldn't call it a weed, it's a Glycerita um, lepidota, which is American licorice, 
but I don't know where it gets the licorice name other than maybe to distinguish it from the um, Asian licorice. But at the end of the day, this is um, a native. Um, it's been around a long time. It's kind of got a showy flower. And the root on it was used <coughs> by Native Americans um, for, for breath freshener and, and other things. It's kind of an intriguing plant. And uh, Lewis and Clark, Lewis said that, you know, they, they ate it on their sojourn across the United States and basically said that it tastes just like sweet potato and had a quite um, appealing taste. So it's American licorice and I, I, I wouldn't control it unless it's in a place that they don't want it, but I would just enjoy the, the diversity of this plant and how intriguing it is. Excellent, thank you, Rock. Uh, you have two pictures for this next one. Uh, this plant or weed they're staying is starting to take over the garden. Is it a plant or is it a weed? It's horseweed and it has weed in the name. Um, actually, the intriguing thing about this plant, it was the first one documented with glyphosate resistance, and now we know there's lots of plants resistant to glyphosate, the active ingredient in the commercially available Roundup product. Um, it's, a, it's a very weak root system on it. It's an annual, so it's very relatively easy to pull up, and in that first picture, it looked like there were five or maybe five or a half a dozen of them. I would just pull them up and um, throw the plant material in the compost pile. Just certainly don't let them go to seed. All right, thank you, Rock. Lewis and Clark see horseweed on their trek rock? Or? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lauren. <laughs> Speechless. All right, your first uh, two here are, this is a Decatur viewer, shellbark hickories, and this is six to seven year old tree. They've shown good grief. Is this nutrition or is this potential disease in hickory? This one had me a little stumped. It, the way it's cupped and has yellow leaves, I, it, I, I don't think it's a disease. I question if it wasn't nutritional or even possibly a herbicide drift event is what I really question on that. I don't see it as a disease. All right. Uh, two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a hawthorn in Lee, Nebraska. She wants to know whether this is bugs or a disease. So I think we have the, the full tree, and then I think we have one of the close-up that is... This is foliage. another... Uh, yeah. rust uh, that we'll see. A lot of times with rust, we'll see that distinct lesion on top or discoloration. Many times it'll be orange to red in color. Mm -hmm. And then on the underside, you would see many times the uridinia, which are the, the spore producing structures that look like little fingers on the underside. All right, uh, treatment? Don't treat it. Uh, it's gonna be cycling over from something else. Okay. This time and then. All right, okay, and yeah. from Plattsmouth, you were excited to see this. He thought it was animal droppings or a yeah, strange fungus. I'm always uh, envious, you know, Kate gets the pretty insects to talk about and I get, you know, dog vomit or whatever here, but <laughs> this is slime mold and very common. You can simply wash it away with a hose. It's not gonna do anything. All right, excellent. Okay, Elizabeth, uh, you have, now you have three pictures of the coneflower from Grand Island. Beautiful coneflowers, four to five years, cut them back, clean them up, didn't do that after reading an article about leaving the seed heads. What do we think is going on here? Should she rogue these out? You know, I was trying to look and see if there's anything pathological or maybe we had some insect damage on here and it was just kind of tough to tell because it looked like it could be spider mites or it could be something sucking the, the plant juices out. And then we have, you know, is it thing, anything pathological like asters yellows? The, the flowers on there look kind of normal. They're, they're just foreign, but they're not asters yellows. So, I mean, the best bet is, is to bring in a sample with on that one to make sure there's nothing pathological on there, but it's just kind of tough to tell exactly what what's going on. All right, those. thanks Elizabeth. And uh, quickly here, we have two pictures of this from a South Lincoln viewer. They wanna know what this is and when they can prune it. So this is privet, and when it comes to privet, you can prune it uh, when it's dormant up to about the middle of summer. Uh, if they really enjoy the flowers, they would do like a one-third rejuvenation where you remove one-third of the canes, and then over three years, you've completely rejuvenated that because it does bloom on old wood. Um, you can cut it all the way back to the ground and start from scratch if you really want to. Um, the easier one of the two is to remove a third over three years. All right, excellent. Thanks, Elizabeth.